Hi, I'm Jeffrey, and right now we're going to look at what the Gospel of Matthew is all about. Now, the Gospel of Matthew is the first book of the New Testament, and if you're familiar with the Bible, then you know that the Bible is divided into two large sections. There's the Old Testament, and that looks at the relationship between God and Israel. And then there's the New Testament, which focuses on Jesus and his followers. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament, and it's really the best possible first book for the New Testament to follow all those Old Testament scriptures, and we'll see why in just a minute. But first, who is Matthew? Well, Matthew was one of the 12 followers of Jesus, and he is traditionally the author of the gospel that holds his name. The book itself, the book of Matthew, is technically anonymous. There's no point in the story where uh, the author says, my name is Matthew and I wrote this story. That doesn't happen. But church tradition has been pretty consistent in saying, Matthew, the follower of Jesus, wrote this book. So that's why we call it Matthew. Now, Matthew was a tax collector. We meet him in the book of Matthew. Uh, and so his job was to collect taxes from people. Not the most popular occupation for someone uh, in, in Israel at his time. He's one of the 12, those, uh, that close group of followers that stuck with Jesus and plays a role in both Matthew's gospel and the other books of the New Testament. Uh, another thing that we should know about Matthew is he was a literary genius because he has put together this wonderful, wonderful uh, piece of literature, which we're going to dive into in just a minute. But why did he make all this? It's good for us to know. Uh, by analyzing the gospel of Matthew and seeing what are the themes that he brings up and how does he position his, uh, his stories and his gospel, uh, we can see that he has a few aims in, uh, in making this gospel. So he wants to present Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament. This is a reason why Matthew is such a great book to follow the Old Testament, because he weaves together this story of a man named Jesus who is greater than all the other heroes of the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures. And he wants to show that Jesus is the fulfillment of those, and he's greater than the Old Testament heroes. He also wants to harmonize Jesus' teachings with the Old Testament. Jesus had some teachings that didn't sit very well with the experts of the scriptures in Jesus' day. Uh, but and the church, after, uh, after Jesus dies and rises again, uh, Jesus' followers struggle for decades afterwards with the problem of, okay, so do we, how closely do we need to adhere to the old Jewish uh, religious laws and rules? And, you know, how do, we, how do we fit the teachings of Jesus and his followers into that? Matthew wants to harmonize the two. He says, Jesus' teachings are uh, vital, they're important, they're, they're the most important, uh, but it doesn't mean that we need to throw out the Old Testament. Uh, which is a, a third aim. He wants to elevate Jesus' teachings. Uh, by the end of this gospel, we're seeing Jesus say, go and teach everyone around the world uh, my commandments. Teach them to observe what I taught, uh, as opposed to get everyone to follow the old Jewish law. Super important. And then he wants to show that Jesus is the king of the Jews and the savior of all people, all whether they're Jewish or not. Uh, the Jews were anticipating a coming messianic king, uh, someone who was going to lead them, uh, throw off all of their oppressors, and rule Israel in peace and justice, and lead the nations in peace and justice as well. And Matthew is saying Jesus is the Messiah, but he doesn't necessarily look like how the people expected at his time. So, that's a little bit of context for who Matthew was and why he wrote this. Let's look at what he wrote. 
Now, the book of Matthew can be divided into a couple pretty clear sections. You have a prologue or an infancy narrative or a nativity story uh, during the first two chapters. And that sets up a lot of the big themes that we're going to be seeing throughout the book of Matthew. And then you also have some of those themes uh, really solidly tied together in the end. This is where we have the climax or the passion narrative. Uh, and this is, uh, this is when Jesus' ministry comes to uh, this, uh, this high point in which Jesus surprisingly dies and then even more surprisingly rises again and tells his disciples what to do about it. But in the middle, the book of Matthew is positioned around five major blocks of Jesus' teaching. And there's some narrative leading up to these, uh, these blocks of teaching. And scholars will call these teaching chunks discourses. And so you have five major discourses and then stories surrounding them that, uh, that tee up these, uh, that, that tee Jesus up to make these, uh, these teachings. So let's jump in and see exactly what's going on in the book of Matthew. When we open with a prologue, uh, Matthew says right off the top, chapter 1, verse 1, Jesus is the Messiah. And then he also says Jesus is the son of David. Uh, David was the greatest of Israel's kings. He was a legendary king, uh, almost, like, almost like a King Arthur uh, for, the, for the Jews of that time. He also says that Jesus is the son of Abraham, and Abraham was an Old Testament hero long, long, long before David, uh, to whom God made a special promise. He said, Abraham, through you, I will bless all the nations of the world. And then he also says that Jesus is Emmanuel. He is God with us, which is uh, really important when we, when we look at what Jesus does and what Jesus continues to do. He presents Jesus as the culmination of Scripture. He says that, uh, you know, he goes into this long genealogy where he says there was Abraham, and then there was Isaac, and then there was Jacob, and there were all these names. It's a long list of names. And uh, he says they're all leading up to Jesus. And he's very, very clever with this list of names uh, because he weaves in themes of prophets and, and the Psalms and uh, even Gentiles. He, he brings up uh, a lot of, uh, a couple people who were not Jews, but were part of Jesus' lineage. So he shows that Jesus is the culmination of the Jewish scriptures, and he's also for the Gentiles too. And we see that uh, further when even the even the Gentiles from a long ways away, the wise men or the magi, uh, travel a great distance to worship a king of the Jews who had just been born. Now, a little bit on that note, Jesus is a lot like David. He is presented as a new and greater David in the Gospel of Matthew. He is the king of the Jews, born in Bethlehem. And he's also a bit like Moses. Uh, because when the wise men, when those magi seek this king of the Jews that was born, uh, the existing king who is ruling that area of the world says, uh, I don't really like this idea of there being this promised new king, so I am going to kill all the baby boys, uh, and that should solve the problem. Well, that's a lot like what happened in a long time ago in the book of Exodus, uh, when uh, the, the Pharaoh of Egypt said there are way too many Hebrew people in my land and they're getting too powerful. So to keep them from having an uprising, I'm just going to kill all the baby boys and that should solve the problem. Well, it doesn't because for Pharaoh, one boy escapes and his name is Moses. And for Herod, the evil king in the book of Matthew, one boy escapes, and it's Jesus. Jesus is like Moses in that he escapes uh, a king trying to kill him. And he goes on to be a lot like Moses in the book of Matthew in that he delivers a lot of teaching. And Moses was the chief teacher. He's the, he was the law giver for the Jews. 
and uh, Moses is Moses is a prophet that has five books of the Old Testament associated with him, the Torah. And here in the book of Matthew, Jesus has five big discourses, his own teachings associated with Jesus. So interesting, uh, good literary work, Matthew. And so we have, at the end of the prologue, we we're, get this idea of Jesus is the king of the Jews. And so we have Jesus' kingdom versus the kingdoms of the world. Herod and the Jews who are with Herod are uh, working together to kill Jesus, and Jesus is the rightful king of the Jews. So we have some conflict between the kingdom that Jesus is bringing and the way kingdoms work in the world of Jesus' day. Now, let's look at the narratives and teachings in Matthew. Uh, what we have is five major chunks that take up the majority of the book of Matthew. And they deal very closely with the theme of discipleship. What does it mean to follow the teachings of Jesus? And so in the first little book of Matthew, uh, we have God endorsing Jesus and then Satan tempts Jesus, but Jesus overcomes Satan and people follow him, which has Jesus giving the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount is a speech about what it truly means to follow Jesus. Next up, we have this book of miracles. We have a set of three miracles, a set of three miracles, and then a third set of three miracles, three threes. And in between those sets, we have uh, small stories in which Jesus talks about what does it mean to be a disciple. And uh, this all leads up to Jesus sending the 12 disciples out to the rest of the Jews to, to be missionaries. And so that brings us to book number three, where Jesus starts coming into some conflict with people. Not, uh, not all the people of, not all the Jewish leaders are on board with this guy, Jesus. And there are some other folks that have questions about him. So you have a bunch of people confronting Jesus, and Jesus rebukes that opposition. But this is where, in the, in the middle of this set of five, we see a bit of a pivot happening. We have Jesus withdrawing from these large groups of people that are opposing him and spending more time with the disciples. He physically withdraws into a house. So there, there are disciples inside the house and there are crowds outside that are trying to listen to him. And he says, my true family is my followers. But he also withdraws at an intellectual level at, at, in, in some ways because instead of direct teaching that the crowds got in the Sermon on the Mount, we start getting parables. And so he's, he's withdrawing a bit into more uh, riddle-ish territory. This brings us into book number four. And a big theme in book number four is faith. You have uh, people, uh, people receiving miracles based on their faith alone. Uh, there's even one woman who is not Jewish who uh, receives a, a, a miracle from Jesus just because she believes he can do it. It's a really powerful story. Um, and we also look at the disciples' lack of faith and, really the, and also the disciples' faith in Jesus. We see the faith of the people of Israel, and a lot of it comes down to who they believe Jesus is. Peter has a revelation and says, Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And in this book, we see a lot of Peter. This is where Jesus starts to talk about the future of uh, his kingdom, which is the church. And so we see, uh, we see Peter rising in prominence, uh, and then we get this teaching on what it means to be great in the kingdom. And it's very different from the way greatness works in the kingdoms of earth. Whereas in the kingdoms of earth, people have this power struggle where they're trying, to, they're trying to seize as much power for themselves and be as great as possible. Jesus says, no, this is not how this kingdom works. We serve each other. We look out for the weakest members of this kingdom. We forgive each other. And so that's what that uh, discourse is about. 
Book number five, we start seeing some power struggles within Jesus' group. We have uh, different different disciples saying, uh, so, you know, I want to be the greatest or, you know, so two disciples' mom uh, comes to Jesus and says, hey, can my sons sit on your right and left in your kingdom? Pretty bold move. Uh, and then we also have hypocrites confronting Jesus. Uh, these are Jewish religious leaders who are saying, you know, we're, we're the ones that, that are in really good standing with God and Jesus is not. They, Matthew sets them up as people who uh, say what's right and don't do what's right. And whenever they do what's right, they're only doing it for show. Uh, so they're hypocrites. Uh, and that's when we get the fifth big teaching where Jesus talks about the coming judgment in the kingdom. When he, when he comes with, uh, with his kingdom, when his kingdom is fully realized, then there will be a day of judgment, a day of reckoning. And then this leads us into the climax, the passion narrative uh, in the, the last few chapters of Matthew. So Jesus sets up a new covenant. Uh, like Moses, he leads the disciples in a celebration of Passover. And Passover was a feast that the Israelites first celebrated when Moses was leading them out of Egypt to the Promised Land. Jesus does this, uh, but whereas in the first Passover, the, the people had to slaughter a lamb as a sacrifice, uh, to protect them from the coming plague in Egypt. Jesus is the sacrifice. Jesus is the one who dies at the hands of the Jews and the Roman Empire. So, big surprise, Jesus is the sacrifice, not like Moses. But, even bigger surprise, Jesus rises again. And uh, after he rises again, uh, he comes to the disciples and he gives the, the close to the book of Matthew, which is known in the church today as the Great Commission. And so this Great Commission ties together a lot of the themes that we saw at the beginning in this opening prologue. Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all my commands, and I am with you always, even to the end. That statement has a lot of really interesting callbacks because Jesus says, all authority is given to me. Well, Dave, he is the son of David, but that's a lot more authority than David ever had. David was a really strong king. Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth. God promised that through Abraham, all the nations would be blessed. And Jesus says, go and make disciples, find followers of me from all nations. So all the nations will be blessed. Uh, Moses gave people the law and important teachings. Jesus gave people uh, five really sets of teaching. And, you know, there's more of Jesus teaching in the rest of the New Testament. Jesus says, teach them to observe my commands. So he's saying, these are my teachings. Now take, uh, take my teachings to the world. He is greater than Moses. And then I am with you always, which is a wonderful way to close. It uh, references the opening where Jesus is the Messiah and he's Emmanuel, God with us. He was with us in, uh, in the book of Matthew as he made disciples and taught us. And he is with us always, even to the end, even now. So there you have it. That's the book of Matthew, and that's what it's all about.